here? Uh, can you hear me? Just yep. to check, double check. Okay. All right. We all good on your part? Yes, we are. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for joining everyone today. Um, so, um, I'm Sarah Provado, and thanks for joining us for today's session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Um, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms across the world. And today we have four classrooms from across North America that are very excited to learn more about sloths. Uh, and our guest here today is all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms across the world. We got a little feedback from YouTube here. Um, and so our guest speaker today is Daniel from the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica. And at TRR, they have focused on care, rehabilitation, and release of natural wildlife since 2004. TRR provides sanctuary while giving treatment, rehabilitation, and when possible, release into their environment. They specialize in toucans, sloths, and owls. However, they have a large array of wildlife from weasels, porcupines, cats, parrots, and so forth. So, uh, Daniel, I'll let you take it away and let's learn some things about sloths. Yeah, all right. So, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Daniel. Like everyone said, hello. Um, so, like you were saying, we're a rescue center. This means that we are not a zoo. So, all these animals that we have here are rescued. We were founded in 2004 by Leslie Howe. She was born in the United States, but she got raised here in Costa Rica, specifically in Guanacaste, that's in North Pacific. So she was in love with the birds and Leslie and Jorge, her husband, decided to go to Rescue Ranch in 2004 with only two cans. And that's the reason why the name, Two Can Rescue Ranch. So they started to rescue birds. And then in 2007, they made the really big decision to start receiving sauce to rescue them. And that's how Millie got here. Millie got here in the middle of the night. Um, she was just a baby, a few months old. And over the years, thanks to, to Millie, um, now we have a, a release program that we're gonna talk about that uh, in a minute. So we specialize uh, pretty much in toucans, in owls, and also in sauce, obviously, but we also take care of oh, many, 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 many other animals. We also have an otter, we have macaws, we have parrots, uh, monkeys, porcupines, an ocelot, an ocilla, that is like a an ocelot, the smaller, and a bunch of other things. We rescued from pretty much all over the country, and the animals that we receive, they come here from, um, from two sources. The first one is Minae. Minae is the Environmental Police or Ministry of Costa Rica. They do rescue the animals in the rainforest or sometimes they do uh, some confiscations because there are some people that have these animals as bad, which is obviously uh, illegal and wrong. And then we also have regular people that they rescue the animals themselves, especially during the dry season. That is where we're getting now. We receive a lot of uh, chicks that they fell from the nest, so people rescue them because uh, there's a lot of dogs around. We're going to talk about that later. And the, the dogs attack them, so let them rescue them, and, and they come here. We have a release site. Um, the main release site is located in Sarapiqui. That's in the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. We are located in San Isidro de Heredia, that is in the central valley. The release site is around one hour and a half away from here, and that's where we release most of the animals, especially the ones that can be found in the Caribbean. We also have a sister organization that is called the South Institute. What they do is that they do some research on the South, and they are located in the Pacific, in Manuel Antonio, that is one of the most popular parts in the country. So if we receive a South or whatever type of animal in the Pacific, we can release them in that area as well. In here, sometimes we do as well release some animals and because we're located in, because we're located in, in the Central Valley and that is in the mountains, we are really, really close to the Braulio Carrillo National Park. That is the biggest land park that we have in the country. And that's where you can find these guys as well. So if by any chance we receive a sloth um, in this area, we can release them 
in an area that is 15 minutes away from here. So now we're gonna uh, talk about the slots. Now in the world, we have six species of slots. Most of them, or four of them, are two, uh, three-toed, sorry, three-toed slots. These ones that you're seeing right now are two-toed, or better called two-fingered. The reason why we like to call them two-fingered is because both species that we have in the country, the two and the three-toed, have three toes on the back. So the difference is on the front. So it can be a bit confusing sometimes. So for us, it's much better to just use two-fingered um, slots. Now, these slots that you're watching right now, um, they, um, they are only found, well, you can find them in both slopes, like, like in the Caribbean and also in the Pacific, but also in the Central Valley. They, they eat, leaves so this means that they are omnivorous because they eat leaves they eat insects lizards if they can catch them and also some eggs and also these cats are nocturnal this means that they mostly sleep during the day or that they do get active during the day as you can see right now and then the three finger sloth that is this one right here there's a bunch of differences these ones, they are uh, herbivores. This means that they pretty much eat only leaves and, and that's it. They also are diurnal. They're just like humans. So they sleep during the night. But also, as you can see, they also sleep during the day sometime. Um, another big difference is the location. You can only find these species on the Pacific and the Caribbean. It's really rare to find this species on the, on the Central Valley. That is where we are located right now uh, because of the fairly cold temperatures. Definitely not as cold as, as you guys right now, especially in winter. Um, so yeah, another difference is the hair. The hair that these guys have is a, is a bit shorter compared to the two-fingered that is a bit longer. Now, sloths are amazing because they have a whole ecosystem in their fur. This includes algae and also uh, moths and beetles that live in their fur. The, the beetles that complete the cycle, uh, especially when the sauce go to the bathroom, keep in mind that the sauce go only once a week to the, to the bathroom and they can hold it even in some occasions uh, for two weeks. The whole idea of this is because when they go to the bathroom that is on the base of the tree, it's where you can find the most predators. That's where you can find the oslas and the jaguars, snakes, and a bunch of other things that they can kill them. So they only go once a week to minimize this risk. And when they go is when the beetles lay the eggs in, in their poop, and, and that's how they complete the cycle. The algae is super important because it's a perfect tool for camouflage. First of all, they're really high up on the tree. Second, they're always like in a ball to keep them warm and also to get camouflage with the algae. So it's really difficult to see them because they're in a ball really high up on the tree. And, and that's why it's really hard um, to, to find them. Now, the, the eyesight of the, of the sauce is really poor. They are, they obviously they don't see like, like we do with that much details and with that much color but they rely on the sense of smell and hearing. So that's how they can, um, they can move around. Now, the, the two and the three finger sons, the moms at least, they have a baby every, every year or in some occasions every two years. The gestation period of a two finger slot, that is the one that you're seeing right now, is uh, around like nine months, so just like humans. And the three fingers saw that is the one with a smile on the mask, the one the one that we already saw in the bucket. The gestation period is around, so it takes a bit longer. The baby will stay with the mom for between two and the baby's not only on hot. Now, sauce are not social, they are hugging each other and really close to each other right here is because uh, when we receive them, I'm gonna tell you why we, we do in just a second. 
they don't have the mom. So they hug, their, they hug each other instead for comfort and for warmth. And then once they go to the high school that these guys are getting there, because when we receive them, they need to go through a process that we like to call elementary. When they get to university, that is the release site, is when they are released. So once they get to this, and they uh, a bit more separate. Now, the reasons why we receive the SOTs are because they get hit by cars. There's obviously a lot of roads in Costa Rica, and they take a bit of time crossing the road, and people in this country, they drive a, they drive a bit crazy. Um, and these animals get hit uh, because of us. They also get electrocuted from car lines because they, when they want to cross a road from the tree, Spring C is a power line. And most of our lines in Costa Rica, they're not isolated, only in national parks. And obviously, as they do not know the limits of the national park. So once they touch the power line, they get electrocuted. And sometimes we find the baby on the dead mother, uh, or the, sometimes the baby can have some injuries as well. And the third reason is that they get attacked by dogs. Now in Costa Rica, we need to remember and keep in mind that there are more than a million stray dogs going around without a home. Because of what is here. And in biology and in conservation, they're considered, they're considered an invasive species because Costa Rica, well, we're like a jungle, we're the rainforest. So they invade the rainforest and they attack whatever, whatever they can. And that's one of the reasons why we receive them. There are, there are other exceptions that do not enter in these categories. For example, in some occasions, if the baby is sick, the mom will abandon the baby, um, and, and then you find the baby. In other occasions, the, the baby fall from the, from, from the mom, and if it's too dangerous for her to come down to get it, then the baby stays on the ground, and that's why people rescue them and they bring them here. But pretty much most of the sods that we received are released back into the wild and that's our main goal. Now, what this one is eating is an hibiscus flower. Uh, flower are quite common in Costa Rica and they love them a lot. It's called chocolate for us. We just love them. And like I was mentioning, people bring the animals from, they bring any type of funds. So we're basically funded by, by donations, and also uh, from people that visit in here. And that means, because we, uh, we also do tours, so people come here, they can watch the slots from a safe distance, they can learn about the slots, about population, and it's uh, to the nations that they're putting in, how we can keep doing what we're doing. We also have uh, a team of volunteers that do great marketing, and they also do campaigns so we can raise money for the sauce, but also for the other animals that, that we have. Uh, around like three weeks ago, we had a campaign, well, a fundraiser that it was called Cheese for Two Cans. We raised money for the Seven Sauce Together program. The Seven Sauce Together program is a program that we have uh, with the South Institute, like I mentioned. They're located in, in the Pacific, in Manuel Antonio. And thanks to that program, we can put tracking colors on the sauce. So we track them for six months and that way we can make sure that they're just fine and they're good they're surviving just well in well and thanks to this our success rate of release is up to 100 percent because we make sure that uh, they're having the wild behavior uh, that they should so yeah So now, guys, what we're going to do is, uh, if you're, that's okay, now um, I don't know, we can move into questions. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, Anytime. Um, all right. So we have a couple more classrooms that have joined us. We have eight classrooms on Zoom here, and then we have another nine on YouTube. So the question period is going to be a little hefty. Um, so why don't we start? with Ms. Munier's class. Um, if you guys want to ask question, you have the floor to do so. Angela, coming up. 
Are there any Are there any more breeds of sloths than you have at the Tucon Ranch? You repeat that, sorry. Wow. Do you have any more sloth breeds at the Tucon Ranch than you showed us? Yes, we do have a lot of more of the, the one I'm showing you right now. They're in the other side of the, of the property. Uh, and we also have way more sauces to release side that are scheduled to, to be released um, as well. Right now, uh, babies, we have around 13 babies. Uh, and we also have, like, in total, like, 30 sauces, including adults uh, as well. Great. Okay, let's head to YouTube for a quick question. So, Miss Peterson's class from McKay, Idaho, wants to know what's a sloth's lifespan. All right. So, but like I said, in Costa Rica, we have two species. We have the two finger. That is this one right here. They can live between twenty to twenty-five years. And then the three finger sloth, that is this one on the bucket. That I know there seems like there's a couple of sloths, but there's two in there. Uh, they can live between 15 to 20 years. So quite a long time. It is a pretty long time. All right, let's head to Miss Lackey's class. They're coming out of, let me just see. They're coming out of New Jersey. Um, you guys have the floor to ask a question if you'd like to do so. Um, how do you keep track of their health in the wild? All right, so just to uh, see if I understood you, you asked how we uh, keep tracking of them in the wild, right? Oh. Yeah. yeah, all right. Once they're so released they're, back into the wild. All right, so how we keep tracking them is uh, we put some tracking colors in there, yeah. and we have all tiered interns that go and follow them for 10 hour night shifts every single day for six months. And what we do is that we use the research of the South Institute to compare uh, what is their wild behavior. So we'll see, okay, so this is a wild stuff and this is the stuff that we release. So we compare it and if they're having the natural normal behavior that a normal stuff will have, then we remove the tracking colors of the, those six months uh, of tracking and, and then they go on their own. Okay, we'll head back to YouTube. Miss um, Bowyer's class, watching from Ontario, her grade threes want to know, how long can their nails grow? All right, so their nails, they pretty much, um, so the nails are pretty much don't grow anymore. Um, so that way when we receive, for example, uh, an injured uh, a saw that they don't have a nail that is definitely, well, it can be a problem, especially if they lose all the nails. But yeah, they don't grow like ours. They grow a little bit slower than ours. Yes, way, way slower. Way slower, just as slow as they move. Okay, let's head back to our Zoom classrooms. We'll go to Miss Michael's class. She has a group of grade fours joining us from Illinois. Valentina, Hi, we have we have two students who have questions about mamas and babies. Come here. All right, go ahead. Okay, Valentina and Lily, come on up. Okay, so I first cut my question is, how do the mom sloths protect themselves? Okay, so it's really, really awesome because the mom what they do is that they will keep him on their chest. And I know that it doesn't seem like it, but they're really, really aggressive, especially these um, slots. So what they do is that they will use their, uh, their fingers or their claws because they're really sharp and they like kind of like dash or like throw their, their arms uh, away. So the predators are coming the way, they will obviously keep their distance. They also have this uh, canine teeth that are really sharp and full of bacteria. They use that as well in some extremes to protect their, um, their, their babies. But the first line of defense is their camouflage. So if they don't see them, obviously they want to attack them. But if they do get to see them, then they can use their claws and their uh, big and sharp teeth. Okay, Lily, 
Lily had one about the baby. Um, have you ever seen, have you ever helped a baby sloth being born? So actually, well, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, not, I'm allowed to say that. Um, not yet. All right. So um, no, so, so far, no. But what we do receive is for mature babies. So these are uh, baby saws that they are born way before the time. So yes, we got to do, but we definitely don't reproduce them in here in the ranch. Now, the reason why we see super mature babies, and I forgot to mention this before, is because in the dry season, there's not a lot of leaves because the dry season is getting tougher and tougher and tougher. So the moms are giving birth beforehand. And that's why we receive a lot of premature babies. But no, we haven't received any baby from least or uh, sauce that, that we release or that is still here. Thank you. Anytime. Some good questions going on. We'll just head back to YouTube. Um, a viewer wants to know if sloths are carnivores, omnivores, or herbivores. You learned that, right? The two-toed ones are omnivores, and the three-toed ones are herbivores. Yeah. There you go. Correct. So well, yeah, like, like you guys said, the two-finger sloths are omnivorous, and the three-finger sloths are herbivores. Very nice. Okay, now let's head to Miss McIntosh's class. They are a group A of. Great Fies from Brampton, Ontario. You guys are have the floor to ask a question. Oops, sorry. I just need to unmute your mic here. You can go again. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, my name is Musa, and um, my question is, have you ever saved a sloth from an animal attack? Yes, we do. Many, many, many times. Now, these animals attacks can be from uh, natural predators, for example, like opossums uh, or even snakes, and sometimes from dogs as well. Sadly, the dogs are the ones that are um, the most common now. So, so yeah, we've, re we've received animals that, that, um, that have attacked by other animals, including the, the dogs. Keep in mind that, that, although I know that it doesn't seem like it, but most of the times when the dog attacks these stuff, the dog is the one that gets the worst part because they're so aggressive. Okay, so let's head to Mrs. Crouch's classroom, a group of grade fives from Smithsville. You guys have the floor, thanks for joining us. Feel free to ask a question. Oh, I think you just need to unmute your mic at your end. Uh, we could have one question. So it might still be a problem. If you guys want to ask a question, you can probably try typing it into the chat and we'll come back to it. We're having a little bit of issue with the sounds. Sorry about that. So while they'll figure that out, why don't we head to Miss Brecca's class and we'll come back to you guys. Miss um, Brecca's class is from Chatham, Ontario, and they're a group of grade eights. If you guys want to ask a question, you're free to do so. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, how can classes like us uh, support your SKI center? All right, so that's an excellent question. So there's many, many, many ways that, that you can do so, to support us. Uh, one of them is to stop animal selfies. Now, I know that it sounds like a bit silly, but there are people that are taking selfies with animals in rescue centers and also in zoos. The bad thing about this is that when you take a selfie with an animal in the background and you post it on social media or you share with your friends and family, you might get the wrong message that these animals are being used for this, that you can get close to the wildlife or they're really good as pets. So if you go anywhere in the world or even from, from your own home, if you go to a zoo, don't take um, any selfies with animals because you will be encouraging a solid growing industry where people are charging people to take selfies with animals. Other way is to 
go to our website and do more like Skype tours, like the one that we're doing today. Um, and, and also educating other children and, and family that the stars belong in the world. They do not belong in cages. But they're not really good as nice. And this is just only one example with the stars. There are many other examples, like with parrots. People, a lot of, uh, a lot of the times, have parrots, and here in Costa Rica is quite common. And we need to remember that parrots and animals in general, at least wildlife, they belong in the wild. So by not having an animal, at least a wild animal as a pet, you're doing a great job for the wildlife of the world. Do you have another question? Yes. How many bugs and insects live on the slot? All right, so there are two species. We have the, um, the, the moths and also the beetles. So those moths and beetles that they live in their fur, it's a species that you can only find in the slot. So responding to your question, only two. Okay, thanks for this breakfast class. Great conversation we got here. So we have lots of extra time, so we'll go down for another round of questions. Um, does that work for you, Daniel? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. Great. So let's go back to Miss Crouch's class. Her um, question was, "Ooh, actually, I think I might have lost it here." Ah, no. What does a sloth need to survive in the wild? Can you repeat that, sorry? Miss Crouch's class wants to know, what does a sloth need to survive in the wild? All right. So like every single animal, they need shelter. Now for the sloth, the shelter, that means a tree. So the forestation is a problem because if they don't have trees, they don't have anywhere to, to live. Also a good source of food. Uh, like we mentioned, the two finger uh, sloths at a distance right here. They need to eat lizards, they need to eat other birds' eggs, they need to eat leaves, so they need to have that. And also they need protection from other predators, including the algae. So if by any reason, that it's kind of rare to find a sloth without it, if by any reason they can't grow algae in them, then that's a bit of a problem. But like I said, there's a rare, rare thing uh, to, to not happen. So yeah, shelter, food, and also they, they need to be able to reproduce. Uh, in order to, to survive. Well, the question does it need a specific type of tree? Hmm? A okay. specific type of So let's go back to YouTube. There's a class from Montana that wants to know um, how high can a sloth climb? Oh boy, they can climb uh, a lot. They, there are trees uh, that in Costa Rica, they're way more than 12 meters. And usually you will only see sounds really, really, really high up. Their, their claws are also designed to dig on the tree so they can climb really well uh, as well. So they can be on the canopy, that is basically the higher level of the rainforest. The higher they are, the more protected they are from other predators. So I would say between 12 and in some occasions in some trees up to 20 meters. Okay, up to 20 meters high. Yes. Okay, let's turn back to Miss Michael's class. All right, I have Jaden and Ellie. Okay, we have um, Jaden, come on up. We have two students who wanted to ask questions. Maybe. All right, go ahead. Okay, Jaden. Um, how many animals do you have at the shelter? All right, so right now we have around 200 uh, or so animals in here in the in the headquarters that is in the central valley. We have more in the release side as well. Uh, and like I was mentioning, of those 200, they are parrots, toucans, slots, owls, and otter. We have porcupines. Uh, we have a nut eater and many, many other animals. So yeah, around 200 animals. Uh, okay, Allie? Now, but that number can always change. Um, Allie? What's the worst, like, injured that they get? All right, so just to confirm what our 
to hear um, to see if I heard you right. You're asking, uh, what is the worst injury uh, or the injury style that we received? Yes, I believe that's what she asked. Yeah, right. that's correct. Okay. What's the worst Perfect. injuries you've seen? Okay, awesome. So amputees, basically. Now we receive a lot of exactly it is coming that we receive soft that they get electrocuted. So when they get electrocuted, when they touch the power line, uh, they, their arm just get destroyed by the electricity. So we have to amputate the arm. And Sally is not only the arm that gets affected, sometimes they do get burned all over. And yeah, those are really bad and, and sad case, uh, cases. But then, but then we release them back into the wild, believe it or not. Sally, there are some people that claim that SAS are not releasable, that's impossible. They said that you can do that with the excuse that you can touch them. When reality is that we've been releasing our SAS, even our PTs that have suffered these horrible executions and they survived just fine in the wild. Uh, oh. So, yeah. Okay, so Laura from YouTube wants to know, um, why are sloths so slow moving? All right, that's a perfect question. So the reason why sauce is so slow is a simple answer, to save energy. Now, the reason why they save so much energy is because if they use a lot of energy, a complete opposite example is the hummingbird. The hummingbirds, they need to eat every minute. The sauce, because they're not using too much, they, they will only need to be at, um, every six hours or so, and therefore they won't be exposed to the predators because they're really slow and they're not moving too much. The hummingbird, that is a bird that moves super fast and because it requires so much energy, is always exposed to the predators. The thoughts, not so much because they don't eat too much because they don't need that energy. So that's a whole reason why they're so slow. Very good question. That was from a group of sevens in Salmon Arm, BC. So let's head back to our classrooms. Miss, let's go to Miss McIntosh's classroom. Hi, I'm Donald. What is your favorite animal at the rescue center? <laughs> well, that position is uh, it's always changing, uh, but I would say that it's the sloth and the dogs are competing with Emma the otter. I would say that those two are the most favorite animals in here. Can you say the sloths and the otters? Okay, and the otter, yeah. Emma the otter is kind of like the queen of the place. Okay. So to Miss Brecca's class. Um, you guys are free to ask a question. I'm wondering if there's albino sloths. Uh, wow, that's a tough question. Um, huh? So yeah, no, apparently they are not albino sloths. Um, that we know of. Uh, that, we know of. Um, that we know, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah that, that we know of. There are always exceptions to every single rule in the wild. So we haven't found we haven't found any albino sauce, although we have found albino toucans. So who knows? Probably they, they are out there, it's just that we haven't found any. Okay, let's go back to YouTube for a quick question. Um, Laura wants to know how long do babies stay with their mom? All right, that's a really good question. So it will depend. So the average is around one year and a half to two years old. Now they stay on the mom for a year and then they, uh, they stay with the mom, meaning not on her, but like around her, for like six months uh, up to a year. So in total, two years or so. Oh, sounds good. So let's go to Ms. Mooney's class. Um, you guys have to oh. There, do you oh. have your question? Anybody else have a question? JVM? Oh. 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 Oh
Can you repeat that, sorry? JVM, they're JVM. asking you to repeat it and oh, speak clearly. How much kids do a sloth have in a lifetime? How many baby sloths do they have in, in, at a time? How many, How many baby sloths do they have in one lifetime? Oh, one lifetime. Well, quite a lot. Um, if we calculate that with the with um with the last span, we can say that it can be between fifteen to even twenty. In some occasions, even more, because they do can have twins, so that can add up. So yeah, between I would say between fifteen to twenty, which is a lot, by the way. Great question. Back to YouTube. A question from Mr. Gunsinger's class in Kettleby, Ontario. Do sloths live in groups or do they live alone? All right, so the sloths are usually solitary. They do not stay in groups. Now, there are some times where they do live on the same tree. The reason why they're living in the same tree, let's say like three to four individuals, is not because they want to be together, but it's because probably well, there's something on that tree that is attracting their, their attention, uh, including, let's say that there's a lot of leaves. So that's perfect for camouflage and also for food. Or there are a bunch of insects, so they are more protein to, to eat from. Now, like I was saying before, although they are solitary, the reason why these guys are so together, as you can see right now, they can't be separate from each other, is because they don't have the moms, so they need to hug, they need to hug, her, uh, hug each other for comfort and for warmth. Right now in Costa Rica, it's kind of cold, uh, at least for us though, it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So they always need to be um, together for, for warmth. But yeah, they're solitary in the wild. All right. So let's head to Miss Lackey's classroom for the last roll, roll the right. Um, the sloths are supposed to move slow, but why were they moving so fast? All right, that's a very good question. So they would they would do move fast for many different <laughs> for many for many reasons. Uh, let's say, for example, for eating. Now the sloths that you were seeing, they were they were just eating flowers. So obviously, they want to get that flowers, so they will move fast. On other occasions, well, they move a bit more faster is to uh, attack or to defend themselves. Now, these thoughts, they're not the typical slow moving thought that you see like, for example, in Zootopia. That is the one in the DMV taking forever. That one is a three finger thought, and that's the typical slow moving, taking forever thoughts. These guys have a bit more energy, so that's why it can be quite confusing. Okay, let's try Miss Crouch's classroom one more time. Let's see if it will work. If not, you can just ask a question in the chat. Dang, I don't think the sound is working again. So if you guys, I'm sorry about that. If you guys want to send a quick uh, message, we can say hello to the group. No. Does a sloth need a specific type of tree or plant to live in, I'm guessing, or to eat? All right. Yeah. So that's a really good question. Now, the two finger sloths, that is the ones that we're, that we're watching right now, they will stay um, in a bunch of other trees. Most, or at least the one that they like the most, is the poro. And the three finger sloth, that is the one with a smile on the mask, it will stay usually, and most of the time, in the guarumo tree. The guarumo tree, uh, or cyclopia, that is a genus, is a tree that grows pretty much everywhere. It's considered a pioneer tree because they grow after there was like a disturbance on the rainforest. Let's say like a deforestation, like deforestation, or like a hurricane, or like a tornado, although in Costa Rica there's not a lot of tornadoes. Um, or a big tree just fell on the on the on the ground, so now there's more space for all the trees. The guarumo are the first ones to grow, and that's the reason why the three finger saws love them because they're pretty much everywhere. They can have a constant 
flow of food that in their cases is leaves. Okay, one last question, Ms. Crouch's class calls. She, she said that you said they were aggressive at times. So why is it yeah. that they look like they are so friendly to you? All right, so right now, believe me, believe me or not, they're not friendly. It's just that um, we have like leaves and, and flowers uh, and they kind of sometimes see the humans as a mode of transportation to the tree. So especially now, these, baby, uh, these babies, and all well, as you can see, they're getting a bit aggressive. Uh, so yeah, when they're babies, they're less aggressive. But once they get to the outer hood, that is a year old, that are those ones that you saw that we're having like a, a bit of a discussion, uh, they start getting way more aggressive. But it's just that we're the source of food for now. And that's the reason why they're not that aggressive to us. But that's still, that doesn't mean that uh, they don't bite us. You can ask any of the vets, they're covered by scars uh, of these thoughts. So they're definitely not as cute and friendly as they look. <laughs> yeah, no. They're really cool and cute, and cute to watch, but you need to watch from a distance. This is fair. Okay, well, Daniel, thanks for answering all these questions and facilitating a great conversation. And thank you to all the classrooms for joining us. If you guys want to check out more Hangouts, you can go to our website, Exploring by the Seat. Um, dot com or check us out on twitter to check out some more hangouts that we'll be having so thank everybody for joining us why don't we give daniel and the toucan ranch a big round of applause and a thank you for taking the time out of the day to talk to us about sloth <laughs>